Hello, everyone. Thank you for being back here today for our study on the Trinity. We are just so grateful to have this time together and to continue uh, on in understanding the importance of knowing all that God is. Last week, we looked at two views, one being monotheism. There is only one God with three manifestations, one being with three essences, or do we know a God who is actually three separate beings? Is the Trinity three separate ones or three within one? What does the Bible tell us? Because the important thing is not what we've heard or what anyone has said, but what have we, you and I as Bible students, what have we come to see that the Bible in its totality tells us? If the Trinity is three persons existing simultaneously as one essence, then Jesus could not have died for our sins because one would have to be separate from the others in order to die. We probably, many of us, have never entertained that thought. And the thought about Jesus actually dying, has, it's, the thought has just been a fleeting thought. We read it, we sing about it, but we don't really ever stop to really get what God is revealing about himself when he tells us that he died, that he was dead, and now he is alive. And it's so crucial for you and I to understand this. It is all the difference in understanding prophecy, in understanding what love is truly about. And that's what I hope to unfold for us today, that we will be able to look at things in a bigger way, in a grander way, and understand the depth of God's love for us. The Alpha and the Omega, the Lord God Almighty, the God who spoke to Moses in the burning bush, a divine, immortal God, died. He ceased to exist to pay the price of sin for us, for the wages of sin is death. Now, if we have one essence, one God with three different personalities, a manifestation cannot die. An essence cannot die. An essence cannot lay their life down. One being cannot die and raise himself. So then, if we believe that God is in essence, the price for sin then cannot, has not been paid. Because the Bible is clear in the book of Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. The entire Jewish um, sacrificial system centered around on the shedding of blood. The lambs were brought on a daily basis, and they were slaughtered. They were killed with blood drained out to demonstrate to God's people that the price of sin has a severe cost, a huge price. Life is taken. And in order for them to have their sins transferred away from them on a daily basis and on a a yearly basis, There had to be blood shed. So Jesus could not pay the price for sin for us and redeem us without the shedding of blood. So if we believe that God is an essence and with different personalities, then it is impossible for an essence to pay the price that the Bible says is required for the redemption of sin. Jesus says in Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. And a few verses later, he says, I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, 
I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and the grave. I was dead, and I am alive. Either Jesus died or he didn't. If he truly didn't die, then this verse makes Jesus out to be a liar. We have a God that was our Savior that is a liar. Have you ever thought about that? He himself says, I was dead. I think we all understand what that word means. I was dead and now I am alive. The Apostle Paul clearly separates the deity of Jesus and the deity of the Father. In Hebrews 1, he says about the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. This is one God talking to another. Your throne, O God, the Father is saying about Jesus, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. For you loved righteousness and you hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, he's saying, Therefore I, Jesus, your God, the Father, I have set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Isn't that a beautiful verse? And then he says, he also says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and heavens, and the heavens are the work of your hands. The Father doesn't say, in the beginning, I laid the foundations, because the Father is not the creator. Jesus is the creator. He says, they will perish, everything that you created will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. And if you notice the greetings that Paul uses in in the letters that he writes, he always says things like this, the verbiage, grace and peace to you, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus. And James says, I am a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus. When you read the New Testament, it has been made more clear because of the death of Jesus that they're talking about that God raised Jesus. In Galatians 1, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So grace and peace to you from God the Father and from Jesus. Paul again, separating the two, always separating the two, giving validation to two gods. He knows two beings. He states two beings. And if you look at Ephesians and Philippians and Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, all the same. You're going to see the greetings are from Jesus and from the Father. I want to look at a couple of very key verses that you and I have to decide about one God versus plural gods. Elohim being translated, what it means is gods, plural. So this is Jesus in the garden when he is taking on sin and when he is saying, take the cup, Father, would you take the cup? Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. If you're talking about an essence, this is a very strange situation that's happening here. Because Jesus is speaking then to a manifestation of himself. He's speaking to himself. He's not speaking to another being. He's not saying, is there any other way, Father? Can, can there be another plan? This is huge. And we know that he asked that three times. The weight was so huge because he knew that taking on our sin meant one thing, separation. The Father cannot dwell with wickedness. He would take on sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And then in John 6, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Did the Father send a manifestation of himself to earth? so that his will could be done. 
Matthew 3, 17. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. If the father speaking about how much he loves himself. See, when you start to read the Bible with a different mindset and a different possibility. And again, I have to say, you know, if, you, if this is a new thought to you, of plur, the plurality of what Elohim actually really means, it, you know, it's, it may be strange for a little bit, but we have to always be willing to do what Paul says, test everything, hold on to the good. The thing is that Christians aren't testing anything because they're not reading their Bibles. That's the problem. Not really considering what the Bible says because we're not reading it, we're not taking it in, we're not looking. Once you're willing to consider, and you know, last week I talked about the, the willingness to whatever it is that you believe, just, to, just act like you're just putting it on a table for later. It'll be there if you want to go back and pick it up. Just because you're willing to consider something different than what you've heard does not mean that you have to change your mind if you do not find enough evidence to hold on to. That's good. God says to test everything. And once you start reading the Bible and understanding that God is plural, that Moses understood clearly what Elohim meant, then you are willing to, when you read the Bible, you can see different things. The Bible reads differently than it did before. Otherwise, it doesn't really make the sense that it could. And this is why God's love is truly not understood. When you understand that Jesus laid down his life, an immortal being who had life within himself, became flesh so that he could die. He he took on human flesh that had blood flowing through it where his life could be taken. Wow. And it's hard to really go there for too long because it's, it's just too big. It's too grand. It's too amazing that you and I are loved to that degree. Each one of us. God values each one of us. If our value is a trillion dollars and he values each one of us at that, and he was willing to pay the price for each one of us, and because he is an immortal divine being, his life is worth, it's priceless. His life can be used to pay as many as want to be a part of his family. It's beyond. When... We come to really get that. Allow the Holy Spirit to get us to understand this part of what the Bible is saying. You'll never be the same. When you read the Bible, it'll never be the same. It's not just one God just arbitrarily doing stuff. You know, just, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. It's so important to, to be willing to consider this because as we're going to go into Revelation story, it will not make sense without understanding the Trinity first. Mark 15, 34, when Jesus is crying out to the Father and the Holy Spirit, he says it twice, my God, my God, Father and Holy Spirit, both forsake him. Is he forsaking himself? Is he yelling out to himself? When you look at the cross and you contemplate and consider what happened there, I don't understand, and I, you know, I came from understanding zero as, as growing up in the Catholic faith. When you really just are willing to look at the truth and say, Holy Spirit, show me, and you see these things, it's amazing. Jesus was not talking to himself. He's not talking to a manifestation of himself. He is talking to another being, and an, actually two beings that are part of his divine family that have had to forsake him so that he can pay the price for sin in totality and demonstrate a faith that no one else will ever have to demonstrate. In Galatians 1, Paul says that he's an apostle sent not for men, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and 
God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. So did the Father raise up a manifestation of himself? I've taken last week and this week to look at many, many verses, and there's many others that you'll find as you start reading that require an answer. Why is there so much confusion? And why is, is it necessary to understand, and why are so many Christians not understanding about what, who God is and if there's one God or the plurality of gods? Who is God? There are many religious systems. We have Eastern mysticism, Catholicism, Protestantism, Islam, atheists, Judaism, and heathenism. And so, depending on who you ask around the globe, every person falls into one of these categories. And who is God? Well, I want to ask you, who has made this mess of this many different understandings of who God is, because the bottom line is that the devil knows who God is. And he is the grand deceiver and the father of lies, the Bible says. And the devil himself, when he was Lucifer and he was in heaven, he heard from the father and he saw the creator and he knows that there are two gods. And Now he understands that there are three gods because the Holy Spirit has left him forever. And so what better way to mess up humanity than to take three and then make hundreds? I mean, people worship cows. People worship stars and planets. People have invented gods. People make statues and worship them. I mean, think about how many gods are out there. When Jesus was going to take the the Israelites out of Egypt, he dethroned ten of their gods. Every plague was aimed at dethroning one of their gods. And so, but there were many, 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 many gods. In fact, in the Old Testament, as the Israelites went through, and, and if you have, have a good understanding of the Old Testament, people in the, in the Old Testament days, they would ask, which, which god? Which god has, has blessed you with, with crops? Which god has given you? You know, because they have a god for fertility and a god who rains down on, and a god for the seasons and a god that grows the crops. So, you know, which God, why you, all your gods are working for you. And God wanted a group of people that would know the truth about him and so that they could say, no, the God of heaven, the creator of all things, he is the one who is bringing blessing. And so the devil has made a mess of what God wanted for us to understand about him. And so now there are many, many gods, and that's called polytheism. You know, the understanding of many gods. And there's a lot of confusion, and so the word polytheistic become, if you start talking multiple, oh, bla- you know, that's blasphemous, that we can't even look at that because, you know, the Bible says that there's only one God. So we need to take a look at that right now. I want for us to understand that the, one of the reasons that, I, that I'm building a foundation on this is because when we get to Revelation 13, we're going to see that there is a beast that comes out of the sea, and the sea in the Bible is a people. This is a, um, a worldwide government that comes out of you know humanity because people make up government. It's going to be a crisis government that arises after, during as soon as the Great Tribulation, Great Tribulation begins, and it's going to be made up of all of the religious systems. There are seven heads on this beast, and each head has a blasphemous name. To, to be blasphemous, that means you are talking against God. And remember that uh, the Jews told Jesus that he claimed to be God, so he was speaking blasphemy. It, the clues that God gives us in this is that these are all religious systems. And when we get to Revelation 13, we'll study that in a, in a grander fashion. But I want you to understand why it's important 
that we see that this beast that rises up out of the sea is made of all of these religious systems of people believing all different gods. And they're blasphemous. Blasphemous. That means God is going to take them all down, including, look at their Protestantism, which is us. Christianity is corrupt. Christianity has been watered down in every way. And even in understanding who God is. And God's grace is cheapened when we're talking about God being one being with essences. It's just cheapened. What he has done is just nothing to really talk about. Big deal. Because one God cannot have a part of himself be lost. If, one es- if an essence is going to lay down their life, then there's no one to bring them back to life. So it's important that we keep in mind this is so much bigger. The understanding of the Trinity in in its complete and correctness, understanding Elohim is important if you want to understand prophetic things. So isn't polytheism bad? Well, the Bible actually teaches tritheism, three gods. All other gods are false. When you look at the Bible in its totality, it does not teach one being. He teaches three beings that have united in perfection. And we'll be looking at that next week in a, in a bigger fashion. Doesn't the Old Testament seem to only mention one God? Yes. In the Old Testament, there seems to be only one God. Unless you are looking for clues, and we looked at a lot of those clues last week, you'll miss them. And remember, if you're going to read the Bible like we put our feet in the sand and just you know move it around a little bit, you're not going to get anything. If you want to look, really look for treasure, you've got to have a shovel. And the truth of the matter is most people don't have time. Digging takes time. And looking for treasure takes time. And most people don't have any interest in that. Judaism was a one-God religion. They rejected Jesus' teachings because his claims as the Son of God made him equal to God. That means there would have to be two. If they accepted Jesus, there would have to be two. And they were unwilling to see that. And so they were monotheistic. They refused to, they said they had, you know, obviously they had the writings of Moses and they said that they understood scripture, but they didn't even understand the very first line of the Bible. In the beginning, God's plural. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Missing just even the very first line. For centuries, there has been division over the nature of Jesus. Paul dealt with Gentiles who came from polytheistic backgrounds and biased Jews, and they all argued whether Christians should be monotheistic or tritheistic. In AD 675, the Catholic Church formally declared the Church's position on the Trinity. So we confess and we believe that the holy and indescribable Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is one God in His nature, a single substance, a single nature, a single majesty, and a single power. The three are one as a nature, that is, not as a person. Nevertheless, these three persons are not to be considered separable. You cannot separate them. Since we believe that no one of them existed or at any time affected anything before the other, after the other, or without the other. And so their position is you cannot separate them. They're inseparable. Over the centuries, there have been some who have challenged the views of the Roman Catholic Church. In 1445, the Council of Florence, the Church affirmed monotheism. The Trinity is one God, but he manifests himself at three, as three persons. So in 1445, again, they restated their very firm position. And the Athanasian Creed that the Catholic says, there's two things in there if you just want to go and Google this when you get home. It says that we are forbidden to say that there are three gods and that the Catholic, and this is the Catholic faith which except a man be- believes faithfully, he cannot be saved. So, if, you know, this is, how, this is the position of the church. There is one God that is inseparable. They believe in three essences. And unfortunately... Most Christians don't believe that they hold a Catholic view. Protestants embrace this 
position, this teaching that has been passed down through the generations. It's just infiltrated, you know, every religious system, and it's just swallowed. Remember the spoon feeding from last week? Yeah, just being spoon fed. And you ask anybody any different, they really don't know. Most people will just quote their church's position. They won't take the time to look, which is so tragic. A false understanding of who God is makes it impossible to understand Revelation's story, which is vital to the last generation. It's vital to us as the last generation. It makes God look exactly like the picture that the devil painted, an arbitrary dictator that does what he wants. Imagine a God who just pops in and out, validates himself, says stuff about himself, glorifies himself, raises himself. It's like this grand facade. Ever thought about that? God, Lucifer, when he, um, well, he obviously, he campaigned and deceived a third of God's angel children by making them believe that God isn't really who he says he is. And then he took that to Adam and Eve and said to Eve, did God really say that? God's really only telling you that because he knows that if you take from that tree and eat it, you're going to be like him. So in all ways, Satan is called the accuser because he's accusing people of things? No. He's accusing God of being unloving, unfair, not really giving us a power of choice. You know, we'll get into more of that when we get into the story of Lucifer. But to, uh, to accept the three essences is to accept something that Lucifer has fabricated and has just cheapened the grandness of who God is. Consider this. If the Father is one God who manifests himself as three persons, why does he search through the whole universe only to determine that another manifestation of himself was worthy to receive the book sealed with seven seals? He makes a search through the entire universe. This is the Revelation 5 that we're going to look at tonight. Why does he conduct this huge search throughout the entire universe? Revelation 5, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who's worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. John says, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. John knows that there's very important information in this. He understands that this book must be opened. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. We'll study later that the four living creatures are how the Holy Spirit shows himself, something very important in the four living creatures. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, seven horns, horn being for power, all power, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. We'll look at that later on, seven angels. Okay, and then this lamb, looking as if it had been slain, he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. How do you take a scroll from yourself? So God conducts a search, and then he says, Oh, I'm worthy. Let me take it from my right hand and put it in my left. Truly, unless you understand the truth about what God is, when you get to Revelation 5, which is a crucial part of the story, it does not make sense. When you understand that there are three equal beings that submit to one another perfectly, they submit to one another in perfect love, that they are united in perfect plan and action. This makes sense just as it reads. 
The Father searches, in walks Jesus. Jesus takes the scroll. And why can he take the scroll? When he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. What are they doing? Why are they falling down before the Lamb? They're worshiping, yes. They're worshiping him. Who is worshiped except for God? So Jesus walks in. He is a divine being. Each one of them had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song before the Lamb. What a glorious thing. Everyone is watching this, everyone in heaven. When we get into the story more, this also is from Daniel 7. In Daniel 7, 9, thrones are set in place, and the Ancient of Days takes his seat. Who is the Father? He's the one holding the scroll. Daniel 7 and Revelation 4 and 5 are the same story. Daniel sees certain things, and John sees certain things. An amazing scene that before the entire universe and many witnesses, Jesus comes in and is found worthy. Why? They sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. What does the word slain mean? Killed. The Lamb of God. Who took the Lamb's life? He was not the Lamb of the Jews or the Lamb of mankind. He was a Lamb of God who was slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God, Father God, persons from every tribe, every language, every people, and every nation. And you have made these people to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Ah! That gives me goosebumps. This is so awesome. And without the proper understanding of the Trinity, this is lost. The grandness of the scene is lost. It is so glorious that this is when the Father gives all authority to the Son to take charge and to start unfolding the very last part of the story and taking care of the sin problem for the God family, and securing the universe for the children that are going to be brought to the promised land. It is an awesome, mind-boggling, fantastic story. And it reads, if you understand properly who God is, that there are three beings The Father is seated on the throne. Only one God can be seated on the throne at a time. And the Ancient of Days takes his seat. The Son walks in. In fact, uh, in Daniel 7, that's the verbiage, one that looks like the Son of Man walks in. You know, a lamb looking as if it had been slain so that we know that without any doubt who this is. And he is found worthy because he was slain He paid the price. He lived a righteous and holy life. He is found worthy. And he is given the scepter of power. And the scepter of power is passed from father to son. And we'll look at this in the weeks to come. But the scepter of power in the book of Corinthians then, Jesus, when everything is complete and everything is made new, he gives the scepter of power back to the father. The unity, the submission, they glorify one another. You don't ever see in any of the Bible any member of the Godhead taking glory for themselves or trying to be above anyone else. They give glory to one another. The Father glorifies the, the Spirit and the, Jesus. The Spirit glorifies the Father and the Holy Spirit and, and Jesus, the Father and, and Jesus. And Jesus glorifies the Father and the Spirit. They each are looking to glorify, to show love, to do for the others. Never is there any. They give and they give and they give and they never take. They don't take. Have you thought about that? Not one member of God's family takes. They receive 
If we give worship, they receive it. If we give them love, they receive it. There's a difference between receiving and taking. They never take. So it is just the most awesome story. And you and I need to understand that so that we can understand the true meaning of what love really is. That's, that's going to be our study for next week. The prophetic story in Revelation 5 highlights the core issue between the doctrine of monotheism and tritheism. When you get to the prophetic story, you might be able to make up whatever you want to about monotheism versus tritheism with other verses, but when you get into the prophetic story, it won't make sense. If the father found himself worthy to receive the book that he himself wrote, then Revelation 5 is a farce. It is a mockery, and God is a fraud. We can't possibly ever trust God because we never know what he's going to do. He can never be shown to be fair and righteous if he's going to validate himself. It's serious. Furthermore, the love, the love of God cannot be demonstrated because it takes two to love. It takes two to love. Otherwise, it's just loving yourself. John 14, 31 says, I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. How can you love yourself? Love requires at least two. If you keep my commands, John 15 You will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's command and remain in His love. It takes two to have a love relationship. And now we're going to get to the best part of the story next week. (laughs) I love the study of who God is. I love the study of who God is. And, you know, I want to try to contain it because I'm anxious to get into the other parts of the story, but I could stay on this subject for months. It is so grand and so wonderful to contemplate the selflessness of God, to understand the love of who, the love that they have between them, to understand what submission is. You and I just have no clue about submission. Because we're always bucking submission. We don't like that. We don't like to submit. We want to have our own way. We want to be right. We want to, you know, be first and only and me best. And God is not like that. You know, we, in a second, want the spotlight on us. You know, God says, we all sing the song, This Little Light of Mine. But the light is, we're supposed to be the light but when we, when we have Jesus, we have a flashlight in our hand, and who are we going to shine it on? You know, because we have a divided heart, we want to do this. Dig me. Look at me. Aren't I grand? Are you noticing me? Did you see me today? You see how, you see how wonderful I am? See what I did? You never see in any part of the Bible God ever bringing attention to himself. Always bringing attention to the other members of the God family. And that just blows me away because it's so unlike who I am. I'm totally the opposite. So it just, it mesmerizes me, it captivates me. And I just want, and I ask the Lord every day to captivate me more in who he is. So may he continue to bless us and give us a greater understanding of his grandness, of his love in who they are They are a holy, holy family of three beings that have an amazing plan for our good. And next week, I'm going to break down looking at each one and how the law of love operates because it's really important. One of the things that blows my mind is that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they all submit to the laws that they created. Wow. Dictators don't do that. No. So it's going to be so wonderful to get to that part of the story. So may the Lord bless you as you continue to study 
and dig and be wise men of this generation, friends. We have to be wise men, and we can only do that if we spend time in the Word. Stand with me for prayer. Wonderful Lord, we are in awe. Every time we look at these things, how can they be? Lord, who are you? Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, who are you? Too grand and majestic, holy, righteous, generous, patient, giving. To say that you do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, that doesn't even begin to even touch the surface of who you are. We glorify you for allowing us to have these glimpses of who you are because I feel like that's all that we can have. Until sin is stripped out of us and we have only Jesus in us, we will not be able to fully worship you, Lord, the way that you deserve for who you are. But we are so grateful that we are called into a relationship with you and that you teach us to submit by showing us what submission is about. Glory be to you, Father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit, for your great plan for us. And may we continue to learn and submit ourselves to you so that one day we will find ourselves in your kingdom. These things we pray and we ask in the mighty name of Jesus.